but, uh, but thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. I also want to thank the, uh, the wonderful staff here at the museum that put this together. Isn't this a great event? This is wonderful. The Sailor Series is phenomenal. We have some of them here. I, James Russell, is, he's in the back there, fearless leader of the museum. Christina is somewhere here. Melanie, I don't know if Kim is here, but uh, these people have been helping me along, guiding me for the last few months, saying, oh, you know, here's what to do, not to do. Anyway, so thank you very much. So for about the next 45 minutes, we're going to be immersed in this wacky world of cat boats, as Judy kind of said, we're all, it's sort of an illness, especially if you own something that's 107 years old and you're still out in the ocean with her, okay? Um, the, we're going to be talking about the, the newest book, and, and as it was mentioned, uh, we're donating the proceeds to the museum. It's a tax-deductible contribution, so why wouldn't you buy one, right? I'm also going, I'm also going to uh, do some cheesy author tricks, lead you up to the edge of some stories, and then say, buy the book to find, to find the ending. <laughs> okay. okay, so here's what we'll do. We're going to talk a little bit about what is a cat boat. By the way, how many people here actually have a, own a cat boat? Anybody here own a cat boat? A few people, okay. Not, okay. Not many, but the illness at least has spread a little bit. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about, about what is a cat boat, a little bit about what, you, what people did with cat boats, you know, what, what, what were they used for, and, uh, and then we'll talk about some of the stories uh, that describe what me and my family do with a cat boat. Okay, so, and I'm gonna kind of be roaming around with the mic. If you can't hear me, let me know. Okay, let's see if this works. If anyone can break this, technology always bites me here. So this is the second book in the series. The first book, which surprisingly sold thousands of copies, which we're amazed, the, uh, as Capo Summers, and said, most of the history of the boat, as Judy said, we researched uh, the 19 owners. I'm the 19th owner or caretaker of this old bucket. And, uh, and it's just been a fascinating journey. When she turned 100 years old, uh, we actually, the Capo Association had a celebration about the boat. And we were able to recover uh, many of the owners, from the third owner to the present. Many of them were in their 90s. And they gave us, uh, gave the, the organization an introduction into how they lived in this boat, some of them using them as fishing vessels. Okay, so back to the cat boat tale. So what is a cat boat? A cat boat is a, is a boat, <laughs> that, mostly a small craft, typically about 25 to 30 feet in length, not very big. Some have been as big as 40 feet, but typically in the 20 to 30 foot range. The characteristics are one is the mast is way up front, about as far as you can get the mast in the front of the boat. That's characteristic. And oftentimes they have a so-called gaff rig sail. That means there are two booms. There's a main boom, and up at the top, a gaff boom. And you can do some interesting tricks with that sail uh, configuration, but it fell out of vogue, I think in the 20s or 30s. And what, what took its place, is a boat that looks sort of like that in, gen in general. You notice the mast moved all the way back to here, and typically two or more sails. And uh, a faster boat, uh, a little more easy to handle in some cases. You could do some interesting things with it. Um, but it didn't have many of the characteristics of the cat boat. So here are the two side by side. One of the advantages of, a, of the cat boat was its ability to be handled very easily by a single person. Uh, they were designed almost originally all of, all of them by as a, as a fishing boat, a cod fisher, an inshore cod fishing boat, and the crew would be the the, the, the complement would be a man, a captain, and a boy. Uh, the boy would be climbing up all around the rigging and all that. The captain would be doing the, the bulk of the work in the boat, and um, the the if you let go of the main sheet here, the boat points into the wind and stops, and so you could pull up to your lobster traps. You could pull up to your fishing lines, and the boat would just stop in place, and you could do your work, and then tighten in the main sheet, and off you go again. So very practical boat. The boat is also uh, half as wide as it's long. It's a very beamy wide boat. And, uh, and this also gave it certain stability in certain conditions. It's also a very shallow draft boat with the centerboard up. For example, my boat, which weighs almost six tons, only draws two feet of water. So we can get into all kinds of little interesting nooks and crannies that a conventional boat couldn't get into. So they're perfectly suited for Cape Cod, the islands, and around the south coast of Massachusetts and New England. A lot of shallows in here. So that's what a cat boat is. And let's see if I can do this. All right, 
Cat boats have been around since roughly the 1850s. So here's a picture of some cat boats in New Bedford Harbor. In fact, they were the most popular boat in New Bedford for many, many years, probably almost 100 years. Uh, they were considered the pickup truck of the industry. They did all kinds of strange things. I mean, a lot of them are fishing boats. Some of them are water boats. Some of them were manure carriers, uh, sewage boats, all kinds of uh, jobs. And uh, they are, were often accompanied by other strange boats, uh, whatever these large ships are, I'm not exactly sure. You know, so other, other boats that occasionally came into New Bedford. You can see the cat boats are here. Um, I was mentioning to, uh, to James that uh, if you look at the mural behind you, uh, front and center in that picture of a lumber schooner being loaded, it's a cat boat. So they were the ubiquitous work boat of, uh, of the era. Thousands and thousands were made. As far as we know, only about six survive. Six of the original uh, fishing boats survive, and we have one of them. Okay. This is, this is it. This is my boat, uh, the Buckerammer. We have, uh, we have the documentation of this boat uh, going all the way back to its keel laying in 1908. And we know that there were 19 owners. We have documentation on all but one of the owners. And we have the original fishing licenses um, of the boat uh, from 1908 to 1924. In 1924, she was considered a derelict and was uh, put up on the marsh to be just rotted away. And uh, the Saltonstall family came across her, uh, the, the famous Massachusetts Saltonstalls, recovered her and uh, converted her into the family yacht. Uh, they added a bathroom and a, in a kitchen, a galley. Uh, and the rest is sort of history. Somehow, through some miracle, this boat has survived all this time. And she's actually probably in as good shape today as she was back in 1908. They don't, they don't make them like this anymore. But uh, this is off of Peyton Aram. OK, a little history of the boat. This is the person that built the boat. This is Charles Crosby, one of the famous Crosbys, as Judy had mentioned. Uh, as far as we know, he built uh, in his shop something close to 800 capotes over the course of his, uh, of his lifetime. The last dozen or so boats that he built were racing cat boats in, in the New York circuit in particular, in Massachusetts a bit, uh, towards the, uh, the end of this gentleman's career, uh, racing cat boats became the vogue. Big money was gambled, and, uh, and this man built some of the fastest cat boats out there. My boat was one of the last he built before he converted to racing cats. So I have, in theory, one of the faster of the cat boats. I've not won any races, though, with it. <laughs> Top speed of my boat, house speed, is about six knots. Uh, we've had her up to nine and a half knots documented in a gale, uh, and that was very scary. <laughs> These are the people that built my boat. We actually have, uh, we know who built the boat. This is the, this is the handsome crew that built the boat. You can see Charlie with the pipe, and, uh, and this is the gang. And again, this was an incredibly skilled crew of guys. They could build a boat such as mine in about 25 days. And, uh, and it cost fully loaded $650, which was about a year's salary. As I said, we have lots of documentation of my boat. Uh, here are three views. This, the, 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 the large picture on the top shows my boat way at the end there on the day she was launched, as far as we know. The, the, uh, that's courtesy of Carol, Carol Crosby, uh, the grand, grand, grand niece of Charles Crosby. This photograph of her when she was owned by the Coggeshall family on, on Cape Cod is in Barnstable Harbor one week before the 38 hurricane. Uh, she was caught in the 38 hurricane. She, she actually sailed from Barnstable to Marion uh, three days before the hurricane, was caught in Marion, Mass, in the hurricane, was found two miles inland in the trees, um, was rescued, put on an ox cart, carried back to Cape Cod, and rebuilt. And uh, the uh, mast was, the, uh, the mass was uh, broken roughly here. And we could actually see where the repair was. We recently blew the mast again. We have a new mast at the moment. But uh, this is a picture of, uh, of the boat in Mattapoisett. And this is when I bought her in 1993. She was owned by Cal Perkins, an interesting uh, native of uh, Mattapoisett. But you can see the boat really hasn't changed too much over the years. This is a view of, uh, of, of a typical water scene. This is Westport Point uh, in the late 1800s. And you can see that virtually every boat in the harbor is a cat boat. These are all fishing boats. Nowadays, if you saw this, you'd see, of course, larger fishing boats are the Nova Scotian lobster boat. 
So this was, the, this was the popular vote, and this is looking north in Westport. If you, if you stand here today, you'll see a few cat boats, and lots of trees have grown in where that farmland is in the background. Okay, so how were these, how were these used? What, what did the man and the boy do with the cat boat? A typical day would begin at four in the morning, morning and end at four in the afternoon. Uh, a boat such as mine was called a, a six-tub boat. We'll talk about that in a minute. And they would set a, tr a trot line that looks something like this. This is called a high trot because the hooks are all about mid-level in the ocean. A low trot for fishing cod might be at, on the seafloor with the bottom fish. Uh, this line would be coiled in a basket that looked like this. This is a tub. And I, I don't have a, a, an old picture of what the snoods looked like, but the, the, the hooks were called snoods, the, the hooks and the line snoods. And each of those would be baited and put around in the basket. Each basket would hold 1,000 feet of line. And a six-tub boat, therefore, would set 6,000 feet of fishing line on a run and about a little over a mile of line with a hook every three feet. Uh, they were family affairs. <laughs> they, uh, before they went out uh, over the weekends, things, things, sales were repaired, things were fixed, uh, husband and wives. This is actually a photograph from England, but, uh, but the, same, the same type of boats were found in certain uh, areas in England. And, uh, and again, kids, everyone uh, brought, brought in. This is, a, this is a boy being groomed to, for, to be the man and the boy. But you see the idea. And again, you can see the, the baskets or the tubs ready to be uh, put in the boats. Uh, there were some innovative rigs too. This is a rig that is a, a crab rig, and it banks on the fact that crabs don't like to let go of bait. So the little chunks of bait instead of hooks would be set out, and, uh, and as, they, as the boat sailed along slowly uh, through this little interesting rig, uh, they would just catch the crabs. So, um, so what, would, what, would you, what could you make doing this? So here's the calculation. Um, 1,000 feet of line in snoots per basket, 1,000 feet of line, in one hook every three feet. You can see that six tubs, da-da. Average weight of a cod in those days was about four pounds, 1908. Um, if 20% of hooks had a keeper, you landed 1,598 pounds, or $15.98 of fish a day. And that was a good day. <laughs> there were some exceptional days. We know there are records of some cat boats landing 5,000 pounds in a day. It's hard to think you could do that with a, land, with a, with a trot line today. Um, and of this $15.98, or $16 roughly, probably about $4 of that would be spent for uh, maintenance and bait and all kinds of things. On average, about $10 maybe net, if you didn't pay the boy, and, uh, which was about the average salary in 1908 for a worker or laborer. So uh, not, a, not a way to get rich quick, basically. And again, the boat would cost you $650 new. So, um, okay, so that's, uh, that's a little bit of the history of cat boats and what they were used for. Now we'll get into some, uh, some of the stories from the, from, the, uh, from the book. Any questions so far? Any thoughts, questions? Go ahead, shoot. Why do they call them cat boats? Nobody knows. The question was, why do they call them cat boats? The answer is nobody really knows. The, uh, so there's some theories. Uh, the Crosbys like to refer to them as boats that were as fast as a cat. That might be it, okay? There's also a Dutch word, which I won't even try to pronounce, that starts with cat, like cat and jammer, something. And they had a very similar looking boat, and that might have been the derivation. And I don't know, Judy, do you have any thoughts on this at all? I mean, I don't have anything better. I just yeah. set off to the editors of the Cat Boat Bulletin a wonderful tale about the Crosbys who consulted a meeting Oh. Uh, really fantastic and wonderful tale. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. We're gonna, yeah, uh, towards the end, you'll see there's a, there's a remarkable boat in captivity called the Pegody, which we'll talk about towards the end, uh, that is, is probably the oldest cat boat in captivity. But we know that even she was called a cat boat back when she was in, in, in the early 18, 18 uh, well, about the mid 1800s, something like that. Okay, so, the, so here's the book. So what I've, what I've done is I've selected um, uh, t for the tonight's uh, uh, speech, the uh, three, uh, three chapters out of the book. Um, uh, one is from the East and West Adventures chapter, and it's uh, somewhat of a ghost story. Uh, the uh, Swallowed by the Wreck of the Angela is, uh, 
is a, a, an interesting adventure we had where, where a shipwreck almost swallowed the boat. And then the last is one of my favorite uh, adventures of all, uh, a surprise party for, uh, for one of the original owners of the boat. And so without further ado, we'll go forward. Okay, so first a little, um, this, this is the, uh, one of the chapters. Uh, how many here have seen a ghost? Show of hands, anybody? Anybody seen a ghost? No. One, one, two, okay. How many here believe in ghosts? Anybody? A few, a few, okay. Well, you may change your mind after this. We'll see, we'll see. okay. We've had, we've had three ghostly adventures in the cat boat over the, the 22 years we've, uh, we've owned her, and this is one of those adventures. The book has two, sto two ghost stories that are absolutely true. Okay, so the story begins in, uh, in Westport, where, at Westport Point, actually, where we keep the boat in the summertime, and all of our adventures begin from Westport. So here's the, here's the point. I think Judy was mentioning that if you cross the bridge into Horseneck Beach, and you look to the right, assuming she's floating, you will see the boat somewhere down here. Okay, and we call that Slate's Dock. Uh, and the Slates are actually here tonight. Um, if it's too rough to go outside, one of the beauties about a cat boat, if this, is, this is Rhode Island Sound and Buzzes Bay out here. If it's too rough, you can have a wonderful little experience inside the Westport River. If you've never been to the Westport area, the Westport River, you owe yourself a trip there. It's just a phenomenal area, especially to explore with a small boat or a kayak. But a cat boat can get into all the little nooks and crannies. And so this adventure begins when my daughter, my youngest daughter, said, why don't we uh, do an overnight in the boat? I don't want to go outside. I just like to stay in the river, uh, but I'd like to get one last cruise in before the, before the season ends. This was uh, coming into the end of October. So we took a trip to an island where my family has gone many times, uh, Judy Island, but my kids call it, and I call it, Pirate, Pirate Island. We've been coming there for almost 35 years. This, this picture, these are my three children, and uh, they're the youngest, Caroline was the one that came with me. She's now 29 years, 29 years old, so it's a, this was a long time ago. And this boat, boat that you see is the Splinter. This is the tender for our cat boat. And we built that ourselves, um, including Caroline, about, uh, about 30 years ago. So this is Judy Island uh, 30 years ago. So here's Judy Island the day we went, we went there. And uh, we anchor up uh, off the island and, uh, and camp out for the night. Uh, a lot of people ask me, what does the cat boat look like inside? Uh, well, first of all, there's no standing headroom. There's a very low ceiling, so you have to crab around inside the boat. This came as a big surprise to my wife, Christine. We used to rent Beneteau 50s in the British Virgin Islands, which have about 18 feet headroom inside. And, uh, and so when she heard I bought a boat, she said, great. And then when she saw that there, you, you can't walk inside the boat, she didn't think it was so great. But this is a view of a, of a typical nighttime view inside the boat. And it's a very, the cat boats are very comfortable, homey kind of boats. It's like an old slipper, <laughs> at least I think so. And, uh, and they're, neat, they're neat old boats inside, especially the wooden, the wooden variety. So my daughter and I uh, camped out in the boat this, uh, this night and we nodded off. And about four o'clock in the morning, she woke me up and said, Dad, you gotta come up and see this. And I said, well, at four in the morning, I'm not sure I wanna see anything except the pillow. She said, no, you have, to, you have to come up and see this. I think there are ghosts near the boat. So I said, okay, fine. So we went up into the companionway in the doghouse. And this is, uh, again, we're just across Judy Island. We looked across to Great Island. She said, something's going on over here on Great Island. Again, we were anchored at Judy. And this is what we saw, uh, this. So I'll just click it back and forth. So what was that? Something was odd was happening on Great Island. Okay, so this is a blow up of Great Island. The, the, uh, what, we, what we saw, let's see if there's a, I think there's a pointer here, yeah. Whatever was happening was happening somewhere in this area of the island. Um, so uh, she said, well, what do you wanna do? And I said, well, let's, why don't we row across and explore this? She said, I am not sure I wanna do that. But we debated it a little bit and finally convinced each other that yeah, we'll, we'll give that a shot. Uh, one of the, uh, the things that gave us pause was the history, the checkered history of the island. The island back in the 20s was the site of an ill-fated uh, home for, um, for uh, single, uh, single mothers. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the mission of the Holy Spirit. 
they built a pretty significant uh, 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 sort of uh, clubhouse or mansion house, whatever, on the island. And, uh, and the whole thing ultimately failed. But there have been lots of strange stories about the island. I think, I think uh, let's see, some, some, someone's here. That, there's, a, there's someone in the audience, I think, who knows about this. But the, the net of it is, is that the place was a, it's kind of a spooky spot. The house was burned down by vandals at some point, And lots of ghost stories around it and so forth. And so now here we are seeing some strange phenomenon across the, uh, across the way from the capo. That, okay. So, a, a, little, a little side, a little diversion here. The, uh, my wife and I uh, met when we were editors of an electronics magazine. And in 1976, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers uh, ran a seminar on ghosts called Psychotronics. And uh, some very uh, distinguished professors who had studied the phenomenon for years uh, presented lots of papers. And from their research, and they showed some amazing videos and photographs, they concluded that, that ghosts were real, and they came in two forms. They came in the form of a bioelectronic projection, which means that an individual was actually, some individual unbeknownst to them, could project some kind of an odd image that would be interpreted as a ghost, mostly under stress. By the way, most of, the, most of their research showed that most ghost stories were fabricated. But a few, they, they detected with their instruments were bioelectronic projections. And I was explaining this to my daughter as we were rowing across to the, to the <laughs> island. The nastiest were the disembodied intelligences. And they, they speculated that there were actually a life form called a disembodied intelligence that was a very tiny, small percentage of ghosts, the so-called poltergeists, things that were nasty ghosts. And there were actually some form of intelligence that we couldn't understand. But a, but a disembodied intelligence, an actual being of some kind. And they had all the science to, to show it. And I'm explaining this to my daughter as we're rowing across. And she says, you know, Dad, I'm thinking maybe we shouldn't be going across right at the moment. So, uh, but, but we pressed on. So again, here's where we were anchored. Here's where we, uh, we came over to Great Island. Um, we landed on the island. The phenomenon was very visible to us. And this is where I'm going to leave you hanging. <laughs> the, uh, I have to tell you that it was one of the most intriguing experiences we ever had. Uh, and you'll have to read why that is. And, uh, next. <laughs> OK. okay. I, I, I warned you. OK. Swallowed by the Wreck of the Angular. This is a, an interesting adventure. The, um, one of, our, one of our, uh, our good friends, Carol Williamson, uh, is a gourmet, amateur gourmet chef. And uh, whenever he comes on my boat, we have phenomenal feasts. Cat boats, I think, were designed, especially the, 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 uh, the cruising cats, for, for grand feasts on the boat, at least in the, if you're not commercially fishing. And so uh, Carol had always asked if, if I'm going to Martha's Vineyard someday, uh, he'd bring the food and we could go and have a grand time. Well, one summer, uh, uh, Jim O'Connor, who's the, uh, sort of the, the, probably one of the best caterers on Martha's Vineyard, visited us in Westport with his cat boat. And he said, tell you what, I, I know your friend Carol wants to go. We'll go, we'll, ha we'll form a, a flotilla and go back to Martha's Vineyard to be in the Edgartown races. And so we, how could you resist? You know? and, uh, and Jim's boat was filled with all kinds of amazing delicacies. He has this incredible ability to produce amazing food with nothing. Um, so that's the beginning of the trip. So from Westport, uh, the first stop was Cuddyhunk. Cuddyhunk is a 12-mile sail uh, from Westport. It's a typical day trip for us. If uh, visitors come, they'll say, where should we go in your boat? And we say, well, we'll go to Cuddyhunk for lunch, and then we'll be back by dinner. So it's kind of, that's the round trip. If you've not been to Cuddyhunk, you, worth, uh, you, you owe it to yourself to get to Cuddyhunk. There's a ferry right here from New Bedford uh, worth the trip. It's a wonderful little island. So the first leg of the trip was to that anchorage area just off of Cuddyhunk, where we would uh, camp for the night and uh, have a grand feast. And we did have a grand feast that night. The next day, um, we, just, we would cut, take a shortcut through a channel called the Canapista Channel. And, and it's, uh, on the charts, it basically says local knowledge only. This, it's, it, it, because it's surrounded by rocks, it's a tricky thing to get through. And there's typically a big standing wave that's in there that's formed uh, when Buzzards Bay is trying to make its way into, uh, into the sound, into uh, Vineyard Sound. So, but we thought we'd brave it. So we came through, uh, the, the, our boats came through. 
large wave, exhilarating. We made it into the Vineyard Sound and, uh, and then began to press on. Unfortunately, something had been shaken loose from the bottom of the fuel tank. There was no wind that day, so we were motoring. Uh, something shook loose from the bottom of the fuel tank of my old boat. And uh, the diesel engine that we have, which is a new diesel, was built in 1976, um, failed. Uh, we have a backup outboard, started that up, and within a few minutes, that failed. And so, um, you'll see the signs here, this is right here. And uh, we thought, okay, fine, we'll get a tow from, from Jim, who was leading ahead of us. Uh, he did not have his radio on, did not look back, and he just sailed right up <laughs> to the channel and left us stranded. We were blowing horns, whistles, things, nothing. So um, Carol and I, uh, very, oops, uh, back up. Carol and I decided to, uh, to basically abandon, uh, abandon the trip and go back because without, without power, the, the, uh, the, the thought of going through the West and East Chop and all the nasty waters on the way to, the, to Eggertown um, just didn't appeal to us. So we sort of drifted, there was no wind, so we sort of, uh, sort of drifted kind of through Quick's Hole and started our way back. And occasionally we could get the outboard to run, but not for very long. And so we, we just slowly, I mean, this, this, this journey here is, uh, looks simple. It was probably, you know, six hours of, of sailing, sort of. It was uh, not, not good. Uh, um, we, crossed, we crossed Buzzards Bay and drifted um, into an area that's known as the Wildcat. And if anyone has been off of, uh, of Gooseberry, you know this is probably one of the nastiest areas. Uh, this is where Buzzards Bay on this side meets uh, Rhode Island Sound on this side. There have been literally hundreds of shipwrecks along this reef called Hens and Chickens and then the Wildcat. And uh, here we are, we were drifting into the Wildcat. There's a blow up of that. Uh, the, one of the signature uh, th things in the Wildcat is the wreck of the Angular. This is a, uh, a cement carrier, powdered cement carrier that was under tow uh, and, uh, and broke loose from the tow and ran aground back in the 60s. Uh, she, her back was, was broken and powdered cement and, and seawater don't, don't work well together. And she is still there, as you'll see in a moment. The, uh, so there's the drift path. Uh, this area is so dangerous that this is one of the places where, where, the, uh, where the locals built a life-saving station. And I know Gay, Gay Gillespie, her late husband, was very much um, involved in producing, the, restoring this, uh, this amazing building. You can, see, you can see here, this is the, uh, one of the life-saving boats. And the poor souls that would be stationed here would, would row these boats out in the heavy surf to rescue uh, boats. The, the largest shipwreck that ever occurred here was the Yankee, which was a, was a, a battleship. Uh, wrecked in the Wildcat uh, that was towed off and ultimately under tow sank off of New Bedford. It's still on the bottom here at the entrance to New Bedford Harbor. So a nasty, a nasty area. This is, this is a, a picture taken on a different day, but you get an idea. This is what the wreck looks like at the, mo at the moment. It was dead calm, no wind, and we were drifting right for this area in here, which is called the Trap. So there's, a, there's some other photos of the, of the trap. We made it, we, again, we were somewhat of in a panic. We were trying to get the outboard started. Uh, oops, I'm gonna go back, sorry about that. We were, we were trying to get the outboard started and, uh, and get, kept getting closer and closer to the boat. We got this close to the boat, right about here in the trap. And I already, I already blew the surprise. And you'll have to read the book to figure out what happened. <laughs> the, uh, Okay, last but, last but not least, the, uh, the Watsons. Um, as, uh, as Judy said, we have a summer house in Westport. And uh, years ago, we had the old-fashioned uh, answering machine with a, with a tape that would record a, the, a message. And we close up the house for the winter uh, and come back typically in April. And so one April, we arrived, and we saw there was a message on the machine. Interesting. We played the message, and the message was left by this gentleman, uh, Jacob Watson. And he said, uh, I had read your first book, and it turns out that my father was the third owner of, that, of your boat. And uh, he and my mother are going to have their 65th wedding anniversary this summer, and I'd love it if somehow we could introduce your boat to the big celebration we're gonna have for that anniversary. And this was left you know, maybe a month or two before we arrived. 
So I called, I called him back. He's a, actually, he's a, he's a minister in uh, Portland, Maine. Uh, said that we'd be delighted to do something uh, in the summer, and we began to plot evil strategies to figure out how I could get my boat to their, to their place. So there's, the, uh, there's, the, there's my boat about to leave. This is a, you can get an idea of how wide a cat boat is. It's, they're very wide. If you see a cat boat coming at you from the bow, you think it's this gigantic thing coming at you, and then it passes and it's not so giant. But. Okay, so uh, the adventure began uh, in Westport as always, and, and ultimately ended up in Sipican Harbor. This is the harbor in Marion. And, uh, and going into the harbor, on the, oops, let me go back here, sorry about that. Going into the harbor on the, on, the left, on the right side is Allen's Point. And it turns out that the Watson family, the Watson Saltonstall family, uh, owned at that time most of, Al, most of Allen's Point. Many of these docks are, are Watson, Watson Saltonstall docks. Uh, so on the, on, the day of the, on the very day of the anniversary, they set up a big lawn party on the, on the front of their house here on Allen's Point. And as if on cue, I mean, the timing couldn't have been better. Uh, we, we brought the boat in, and uh, so we came in and to here. Uh, this is a photo taken by one of the relatives of C. Hoyt Watson, uh, the third owner of the boat. He was 93 at the time, and, uh, and he commented to the relatives, he said, oh, there's an old cat boat out there that looks very similar to the one that I had when I was 18 years old. He had been given the boat as a birthday present by his uncle Bill Saltonstall and spent many adventures on the boat, including his honeymoon with another couple. Uh, they sailed the boat from, we learned later, they sailed the boat from, uh, from Marion, where they had it, uh, to, uh, to way down east, way up into the Piscataway River uh, to visit uh, friends in an old school up there. And uh, in the course of that, this is uh, their honeymoon, two couples in this boat on their honeymoon, imagine. And um, in the course of going under one of the bridges, uh, that, 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 a bridge that had opened, they snagged all the telegraph lines, telephone lines for the uh, Boston and Maine Railroad and, tr and, and destroyed about a mile's worth of, uh, of lines and then uh, sort of discreetly kept going up the river. Uh, the, on, the, on the return trip, um, there was a whole crew redoing these lines and uh, and they said, gee, what's, what's going on here? And they said, some fool came through and snagged all the lines. Oh, terrible, terrible. You know, the, uh, but he has w one of many adventures. He, um, uh, a fascinating guy, uh, uh, Hoyt was the treasurer for the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, his, his, last, his last job, but had a, a distinguished, amazing career in the sea and knew every nook and cranny of, uh, of uh, Buzzards Bay. So much to his surprise, um, it was his boat. <laughs> And, uh, and he, was, he was really dumbfounded. He was in tears uh, when, when uh, we, we landed and shook hands. He was just totally flabbergasted. He had, he had heard that the boat was, had been lost in one of the hurricanes, Hurricane Carol or something in the 50s, and thought this boat is long gone. So he was absolutely stunned. For me, it was a great treat, obviously, meeting the third owner of the boat, but also he was able to identify a lot of the strange hardware and weird things that we had no idea what they were there for. But he said, oh yeah, I, I put that there. That was because I wanted to do blah, blah, you know? So it was very, very interesting. The, uh, he thought that we had made an improvement by putting a portable toilet in the boat. He said, yeah, the bucket that he had wasn't very satisfactory. The, um, okay. One of the people we met um, uh, during this event was this woman, Josephine Saltonstall. Now it turns out my boat, Buckrammer, and I'll explain the name in a minute, uh, has had multiple names in her career. And even though that's supposed to be unlucky, obviously it, so far the boat has had a good, a good run of luck. Uh, she was first named the Esther. And then the second name under the third owner was the Josephine S for Josephine Saltonstall. On the day uh, that, uh, that Hoyt Watson was given the boat on his birthday, that was the day that this woman was born. And so he decided to name the boat after Josephine. And so we actually uh, met the namesake of the boat, um, uh, Josephine Saltonstall. The boat also has had the name Cape Girl. Uh, I bought, when I bought her, she was Cape Girl. We call a buckrammer, uh, uh, and there's an old story there. The, um, uh, my relatives uh, built a boat in their backyard in South Boston uh, back at the turn of the century, an Irish hooker. And, uh, and as my grandmother watched them, watched her brothers build this boat, 
the, um, they were, she was warned, don't, uh, don't go too close to the fence because there are buck rammers in the train yard on the other side. Buck rammers, it turns out, were a type of cat that was bred to uh, attack rats and other vermin in the train yards. And so uh, whenever my, my grandmother saw a cat for most of my life, she would refer to it as a buck rammer. And so we figured that this is an old, scrudgy cat, and uh, therefore the name buck rammer sort of took hold, and that's why we call her buck rammer. Okay, so there's Josephine. Uh, still quite active and a phenomenal sailor. They, they, by the way, this family, uh, they have sailing in their, in their uh, genetics, amazing. This was also a remarkable woman. This is Kathleen, uh, Kathleen Saltonstall, Kathy Saltonstall. Um, she uh, has, had won several Olympic uh, medals, gold, silver, and bronze in sailing. It's a phenomenal sailor. And so when she saw the boat, she knew the boat. She had sailed on the boat many times with Hoyt as a girl and, uh, and knew how to sail the boat really well. And so this is her. She says, I want to fly. I just, I, let's, let's go sailing. Let's go flying. And she just was a remarkable individual. And so we had to go flying, right? So we loaded the, the gang in the boat. And off we went. This is the yacht club in the background. And, uh, and we had a, a full crew. One of the advantages of having a boat that's designed for cod fishing is it's designed to carry a lot of weight. Uh, we've had um, up to 17 people in the boat at one time without any problem at all. And uh, in fact, the, 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 the more people we put in the boat, the better she sails. It's a, it's a ballasting trick. Uh, we've also had 10 people sleeping in the boat, and that's a little bit of a trick too. But uh, <laughs> we often sling hammock, we'll sling a hammock from the boom and accommodates a few more people. So off we went, uh, again, Hoyt and his, uh, his lovely wife at the wheel, um, again, re recreating their, their honeymoon adventure into Buzzards, into Buzzards Bay. And uh, again, they, they were in tears most of the time. It was really heartwarming to see this. And, uh, and off we went. And, and uh, so I suggested since the average age of people in the boat was about 87, you know, so I said, well, we'll just we'll nose out into Buzzards Bay. It was a really blowy day in Buzzards Bay. And as anyone who's sailed to Buzzards Bay or has been in Buzzards Bay, you know, it, it can get really nasty in Buzzards Bay, all part of the fun. But we were in the sheltered part here, but we could see white caps and white water and really nasty stuff up ahead. So I suggested, well, you know, okay, we've had our trick now. Let's, let's go back, you know, and uh, I'm, I tend to be a coward when we sail. And, uh, but Kathleen, Kathleen Solisto would have none of it. She said, there's no way, no way. She said, no way, give me the wheel, we're going out. You know? So out we went into um, probably 30 knot, 35 knot winds, which are fairly strong, and probably something like six foot seas or eight foot seas uh, in the old boat, loaded to the gills with, with geriatrics. You know, and, uh, uh, she would not reef the sail. Yeah, they, what, the question was, uh, did we reef the sail? Uh, you'll see these, these little, little string-like things, reefing points on the sail. You can uh, drop the sail, tie those off, and shorten the sail so that in high winds, you're showing less sail to the wind. And uh, so I, if, if it were me, I would have taken the sail down. I mean, that was, it was, it was uh, but, but no, she didn't, she didn't reef. She scandalized, and scandalizing means uh, if you, if you tighten up, there's a line that runs from the back of the boom up through and down, that's called the topping lift. If you tighten that line, then the boom won't drop any further. You can drop the gaff and the sail sort of balloons out and spills wind. And that's called scandalizing and that accomplishes a similar thing to the reefing. It's a little, little, more hard, a little harder on the sail, but that's what she ended up doing uh, because it was, it was, we had white, we had green water over the bow, it was, it was nasty. But in order to learn about that adventure, you're gonna have to buy the book <laughs> and, and, see how it, and see what happened. We had a fascinating adventure. The, uh, but I'll, but I'll, I will give a little more to this. Uh, we did end up with two souvenirs from, uh, from the adventure. Uh, this is a new, a new painter for, our, for the uh, splinter because the, uh, the painter that we had parted when one of the seas uh, carried the boat and just stretched the nylon to the breaking point. The, um, uh, uh, Hoyt also built us a Turk's head. That's this little, little uh, marlin spike piece right here. Uh, the Turk's head uh, marks the, uh, the, the, the spoke in the wheel when the rudder is straight back. So when, this, when you see this at the top of the steering wheel, the ship's wheel, 
that means the rudder is straight back on the boat. So it's a, it's a handy way to know when the rudder is, uh, is, is amidships, basically. The king spoke. The king spoke, thank you, the king spoke, thank you. Yes. Uh, everyone survived uh, and, had a great, and they had a grand time. And, and, and sad to say, you don't see Kathleen and, and Saltonstall in this picture, but sad, sad to say that, uh, that both Kathleen Saltonstall, Hoyt, and his wife have all passed away since. So this, they passed away within a year or two of, the, of, the, of this adventure. Uh, but it was a great memory for the, uh, for the family. And we have most of the adventure captured in the, in the book. Okay. So the epilogue. So that's uh, that's that's a little bit. You know, that's the tease on the book. So now a little bit more about cat boats. The um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in, in Little Compton, there's a there's a fascinating, wonderful place. If you've not been here before, the, uh, the Little Compton Historical Society. It's sort of the I, I think of like the Sturbridge Village of the south coast of of New England. It's a f phenomenal place. Again, if you've not been there, please go. It's on Main Road near Sacramento Point. Easy to get to. And uh, they've just done a phenomenal job at restoring uh, and buildings and, and things. But the, 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 bu the building of boat of interest is this one, this little thing. And, um, and that's the boat Peggotty. This is the oldest cat boat in captivity. <laughs> the, uh, as far as anyone knows, this is, this is truly the oldest cat boat. You'll see under this is a boat. And, uh, and this is an artist studio, and I, want to, I just want to read this because I don't want to get this wrong because uh, Dora Milliken, who's in the audience here from the, from the little company, will kill me. There she is over there. The, uh, this was built uh, by, um, by this gentleman. Uh, and this is a trick photograph. This is the same man in, twice in, this, in the photograph. This is, uh, the, uh, this is Sidney Richmond Burley. Now, uh, he was born in Little Compton, but he's a descendant of the pilgrim William Bradford. So he's, he was around for a long time. And I love this line. In 1878, he married Sarah Drew Wilkinson, and with her encouragement and wealth, he became a full-time artist. <laughs> he studied in Paris with Jean-Paul Lawrence uh, to 1880, and then returned to Rhode Island and spent most of his life in Rhode Island. And the, but here's the, it gets a little more interesting. We'll talk about what, why, why he did this in a minute. He was a leading member of the art community in Rhode Island. He was a founder of the Providence Art Club. And I know that some members here are members of the Providence Art Club. So this is, this is your founder, uh, which was founded in 1880. Uh, and he was the first president of the Providence Watercolor Club. Um, he had a long association with the Rhode Island School of Design and he was on the board of directors and he taught there. Uh, he also received a degree from Brown University in 1912. Um, but, but the story of his, of his life relative to Capotes is that he found, and I'm gonna back it up if I can, he found Peggotty as an abandoned hulk on the beach in, uh, in Rhode Island. And he thought, he had a vision. He had a vision for what he could do with this boat. And so he hauled the boat, and the, and the, uh, the Little Compton Historical Society has photographs of all this. He hauled the boat uh, from the beach and built his artist studio on top of the boat. And, uh, and, and you know, why not have a thatched roof on top for, 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 to add a little character to the thing? The, uh, so there he is, and he entertained all kinds of celebrities because of his connection with the Providence Art Group and all. Uh, he was actually a, a quite famous painter in his, in his time, especially in watercolors. And all kinds of interesting characters passed through the boat, and, and the Little Compton Historical Society has all that information at your disposal. The, uh, so what's happening now? Well. Peggotty has, uh, has, uh, has found her home next to uh, this large building in the Little Compton historical uh, property. And over the years has sort of, the weather has gotten to her. And so starting, I guess it was, la was it last year, Dora? That, that you began the, the, the Restore last Peggotty? Summer, yeah. Last summer. Last summer, the, uh, the, the Little Compton Historical Society began to uh, uh, raise funds to restore the boat and also to move her to her new home. And they, which is around the corner, but there's a magnificent new uh, shed being built to, to, house, to house the boat. And uh, so it's a couple of photographs here of the boat in motion. So she'll be, she will be located um, under this, this new structure, uh, still left open to the weather to keep her nice and tight. Boats, old wooden boats like to be out in the weather. And, uh, and there's a full up restoration going on of the boat. Uh, uh, many of the, the, the paint and details will be left 
uh, original. Uh, we don't want to go too far with this, but, but uh, this is a, a, a quite an amazing artifact. It will not be inside. It won't be a, a curio inside a museum. It'll be a curio outside the museum. And, and uh, if you ever get a chance to get down to that area, I recommend you, you can go inside the boat. It's fascinating what it looks like inside. You can see uh, how Burley laid the boat out. And, uh, and also, and I'd strongly encourage you, if uh, th those of you who are philanthropic, uh, to, uh, to send uh, these folks a check. This is a, a worthy cause. It, is, it literally is the oldest cat boat that we know to be in existence. And, uh, and its history is so fascinating. And there are so many good people trying to, trying to uh, take care of this old boat that it's a, it's a, worthy, it's a worthy cause. How are we doing on time? I don't want to keep you guys too late. Okay, we'll keep going a little bit more. So there's, uh, there's, there's where we are in the Little Compton Museum. And that's basically it. So uh, again, we'll have a book signing afterwards. If you are so inclined, come on by. Uh, you can make a donation and uh, walk away with the book. And you can see how all those stories ended. Okay, and that's it. Thank you. Any, any questions, any thoughts? Does anybody have any questions or not? I mean, I'll be around, so just ask. Yes, question. Were cat boats only in this area, or were they in England? They, they were, most of the cat boats that we saw here were, were mostly in this area. Boats of, a, of similar, called Una boats, did make their way into the UK. In fact, some even argue that they were originated there. Or they were, but uh, they, but they, some of them, wherever there were shallow waters and you know, lots of sand or mud, you found boats similar to this. But most of the cat boats, as far as we know, were in the the sort of the south coast of New England. My boat, we know, uh, went as far south as the Chesapeake. And there is a, a group of cat boaters in the Chesapeake. And we know of cat boats in the Chesapeake, a little bit different design in some cases, but, uh, but mostly a fairly local, local boat. The bulk of them were here.